Hello, intro physics students. Uh, in an effort to keep you guys learning during our period of isolation, uh, we are moving to a flipped classroom, which will be containing a combination of labs uh, in a simulation variety or whatever else we can think of. And in lieu of classroom lecture, we'll be having these uh, flipped lessons. So our first flipped lesson, uh, Ms. Tier is making a graphic organizer uh, for you to keep track of everything, keep track of your notes. And this first lesson is on equilibrium and oscillations and pendulums and oscillators. So a little bit of the background with simple harmonic motion and the specifics about oscillators. Now in this uh, video, we'll be talking about both um, horizontal and vertical oscillators. So uh, we'll be talking about the mathematical kind of constructs of both of them, but they are essentially the same thing. Now, before you actually watch this video, you should complete or should have completed the first lab on simple harmonic motion. Uh, it's a web quest. Uh, there are three different procedures in this web quest. The first procedure uh, was about pendulums. So you got to manipulate uh, the pendulum and kind of take a look at a couple of the things that affect the pendulum. The second procedure was on a vertical oscillator. Um, and taking a look at what affects the vertical oscillator. And then the third one is going back to the pendulum and taking a look at the energy in the pendulums as well as uh, the vectors for both velocity and acceleration uh, in pendulums. So make sure you check out uh, both of those or all three of those uh, different procedures and you should have completed this before watching this video. It'll give you a good background of the things that it is that we're going to be talking about. So in this, we're going to be taking a look at this concept of simple harmonic motion. And to kind of get us understanding of what that is, we want to kind of actually take things back just a second. And what I have here is I have on this picture on the right, I have like, think of a marble sitting in a bowl. That marble, if it's just at that kind of that middle point in the bowl, it's kind of happy. Nothing's going to happen to it unless something outside affects it. And we call this the equilibrium position. This is the midpoint. It's in the middle of everything, um, and it's equilibrium. It, there's no net force. It's just going to be chilling out there um, until something else happens to it. So if I take this marble and I push it up the side, um, I have... Well, there's a gravitational force that's going straight down. And with that, there's there's obviously there's a normal force pushing up and there is a Y component of gravity. Um, but there's also this X component of gravity, which is represented by this red arrow. And that is going to be a net force that's going to want to push it back towards this equilibrium position. So we call that a restoring force. And if it's the object is pushed away from equilibrium, uh, then the marble's weight, in this case the weight in the uh, x direction, will bring it back towards equilibrium. And that's called a restoring force. So anytime we have this type of motion, there's something going on with forces, and that's going to bring it back into equilibrium. But when it goes towards or down towards equilibrium, when it's released, it's not going to stop at equilibrium. And the reason that it doesn't stop is because when it hits equilibrium right here, it still has some velocity. So the restoring force brings it back to equilibrium and it has some velocity. So it actually passes equilibrium and then it goes up the other side. And if we just let this marble roll back and forth, it's just going to keep going back and forth, assuming there's no friction. And it's just going to be going up and down the side of the wall. Now this is called this repetitive motion is called an oscillation so it oscillates back and forth so when you did the the lab you had the pendulum and the pendulum was swinging back and forth well it's not swinging back and forth it is oscillating back and forth and when you had the vertical hanging mass it was oscillating up and down now to categorize and to um or characterize and to kind of explain what's going on with oscillations, we look at back at the terms of period and frequency that we looked at way back when we talked about uniform circular motion. So we're going to talk about that again right now. Now for any oscillation, the time to complete one full cycle is the period. So if I think back, the period of the earth going around the sun, right? 
uh, that's 365.25 days. So it takes 365 days for one complete cycle. Now for a, for a pendulum, right? A pendulum, if I have a mass hanging at the end of a string, a pendulum, the period is all the way forward and all the way back. So that is one complete period. One complete cycle means all the way forward and all the way back. And that's the time that it takes to make one complete cycle. And that is of course measured in seconds. Now the frequency is the number of cycles per second. So frequency we talked about, like you can think of like RPMs. So if I have like a drill and it spins at 5,200 RPMs, that's the number of cycles that it's making uh, every minute. But remember Hertz frequency is measured in Hertz and that's measured in cycles per second. So I could always convert that if I needed to from RPMs to cycles per second, but frequency is the number of oscillations or the number of cycles in every second. So as I look at oscillatory motion, uh, let's take a look at that bowl as it's, or that marble as it's in the bowl. So let's say, uh, here's our first picture here. In picture one, this marble is at um, this position. It's, let's say that this is our zero point. That's our equilibrium. This is the positive position. This is the negative position. Well, back at the beginning of the year, we made position, velocity, and acceleration versus time graphs. And the easy thing about that is, that they were either linear or exponential if it was constant velocity, and we were able to graph that. Now with oscillatory motion, things get a little bit more complicated because as I am, I start at this positive position in picture one, in picture two here, I am actually back at that zero position, and I'm moving in the I'm moving to the left. So this is actually the negative direction. I'm moving in the negative direction. Now uh, in picture three here, I'm all the way at the left-hand side, which is a negative position, but what's my velocity? Well, my velocity at that point, at that highest point, is gonna be zero. So I'm not at equilibrium, but I have stopped. Well, what we just talked about was restoring forces. That restoring force will push me back towards equilibrium. So now in picture four here, I'm at the zero point, but I have velocity is positive. And it just kind of keeps going back and forth. Now, if I look above where these lines are pointing to, every single point on these uh, four pictures that we've talked about so far correspond to a point on this graph, and even the one that we didn't talk about. Now, what kind of graph is this then? Well, this is a cosine graph. So it falls under the category of a sinusoidal graph, meaning it's either a sine graph or a cosine graph. And depending on when we start examining it will tell us um, if it's a sine graph or if it's a cosine graph. But the point is that it follows this sinusoidal motion. It follows this speeding up and slowing down, moving back and forth between a positive and a negative position. So our zero point, that's our equilibrium. We saw that in picture four and in picture two, that's our equilibrium point, but we still have velocity at that equilibrium point. And anytime we have this repetitive motion that gives us a sinusoidal oscillation, we call that simple harmonic motion. Simple harmonic motion. And that can be pendulums, that can be things oscillating on a string or a spring rather, that sound, there's a lot of different things that we're going to be talking about through the duration of this unit that all fall under the category of simple harmonic motion. So uh, a couple other things to help us kind of understand and explain what's going on. Um, we're going to talk about this concept right now called amplitude. Now amplitude is the object's maximum displacement from equilibrium. So here on this picture on the, on the right here, I have a not a vertical, but a horizontal oscillator. And there's a zero point right here. And what happened was, is I stretched it out to the right. So I stretched it out some distance to the right. Now that distance, the distance from the equilibrium position to the furthest away from equilibrium position, that is known as its amplitude. That's its maximum displacement from equilibrium. Now, as I allow this, as I release this, um, 
this will oscillate back and forth. And it'll, as you can see from this graph here below, this falls under the category of a simple harmonic motion or a, an oscillator. And it's just going back and forth between amplitude and the negative amplitude. So at every time it hits this amplitude point, that's where it turns around and starts going the other direction. So it, it's always undergoing a linear restoring force, so it always has some type of simple harmonic motion. Now we could also take a look at uh, vertical masses. It's the same concept. Um, so here uh, I have this mass hanging. It's Normally it's the unstretched spring is right here. We talked about Hooke's Law, right? As I hang that mass, it's going to stretch that spring just a little bit because now I have this extra weight force. And then that'll also give me this restoring spring force. So gravity will actually determine um, where that equilibrium position will be. But then if I stretch it further from that equilibrium position, or if I lift it up from that equilibrium position, I will have an unbalanced uh, force and that will kick off my simple harmonic motion. And it'll oscillate up and down with simple harmonic motion. So if I have a mass on a spring, what you should have seen in the procedure two of the simulation is that the things that affect the simulation are the K or the spring constants. So um, if I have a higher spring constant, it's a stiffer spring, it should oscillate back and forth faster, which means it would take less time if I have a higher spring constant. So when you, uh, you move the slider on the spring constant, and as you moved it up, it should have moved back and forth faster. Now, the other thing that affects it is going to be the mass. So the mass on the spring, um, the more and more mass it has, now think of it as like it has more inertia. So the more and more mass it has, the longer it's going to take to move back and forth, the larger the period. So that's true for masses on a spring, whether they're vertical or they're horizontal. The mass and the spring constant are the only two things that affect the period. So these are your equations for frequency and for period for a um, sprint mass on a spring. Uh, you'll notice now uh, the frequency and the period, they look very, very similar. But if you recall, the frequency is one over the period. So these two formulas right here are actually inverses of one another. Now the pendulum, the pendulum was the first one you looked at and maybe you got a little frustrated, I don't know, but a pendulum is just a little mass on a string and you probably tried a few different things, right? You tried increasing that mass, you tried um, increasing how far you pulled that pendulum back and those two things do not affect how long it takes the pendulum to move back and forth. The reason is the more that I pull it back, the greater this angle becomes, the greater this angle theta becomes, the greater that restoring force is as well. So a pendulum, very simply, is just any mass suspended from a pivot point by a string. So here's my pivot point up top, and uh, there's a mass uh, attached to the end of it. Now, in this case, there is still a tangential component of the weight that's causing that restoring force. So this again gets us um, in some simple harmonic motion. Now, a little confusing, this actually moves in a circular arc, not a linear back and forth. So we use some, some things called a small angle approximation. There's some mathematical things behind it that we don't need to worry about. But I do get formulas again for frequency and for period. And uh, what we notice with uh, the pendulum is that the only things that uh, matter is the length of the string. So if you, when you manipulate the length of the string, the larger or the longer that string is, the longer it takes to go back and forth. So it gets a little confusing, but period is the amount of time that it takes to make one complete cycle. So if it's moving slow, I always confuse this, if it's moving slow, that means it's a higher period, a longer period, a bigger period, a bigger number. So if it's the slower it moves, the larger the period. But conversely, the 
lower the frequency because the frequency is the number of oscillations every second. So if I make that string really, really long, so this pendulum right here, I got the mass at the end of it versus this pendulum right here. So pendulum one, pendulum two. Pendulum two has a longer string. So as it moves back and forth on its oscillation, it's going to take longer to move back and forth. Now, the only other thing that is a factor in this case is gravity, which um, is really difficult to actually manipulate. Uh, until I go back to my home planet, I don't see that happening. So these next two slides are extremely overwhelming. You can feel free uh, to take a second and pause this video and read through not five uh, but actually nine different points. So there's this slide on the next slide. There's nine different points that, that talk through every single point uh, or, or several points that are good with a vertical oscillator that kind of help us put together three concepts. Now, I'm not going to go through all these nine points. This is something that I, I would sometimes do in class and probably confuse more of you anyway. But if I look at these nine points, I get my position, velocity, and acceleration versus time graphs. And what I notice about that is that this uh, position graph, that is a co cosine graph. The velocity graph, that is a, well, it's almost a sine graph, but it's upside down, right? That's a negative sine graph. And my acceleration versus time, well, that's almost like a cosine graph, but it's upside down. So that is a negative cosine graph. Um, so if you um, are familiar with sine, cosine, tangent, right, from, from trig or from uh, geometry or whatever, algebra two, right? So um, that'll help you kind of understand what's going on with the, where we are at each point. But in physics terms, all we care about is that these are simple harmonic motion. Here's the, here's the other four uh, points. But all we care about is that it's simple harmonic motion and we oscillate back and forth. Now, a couple things to note with these graphs for the position versus time graph. We already talked about this. It goes back and forth between its amplitude. Similarly, the velocity versus time graph, it doesn't go back and forth between its amplitude because it's not you know, a position, it's velocity. It goes back and forth between its maximum velocity. And likewise, acceleration goes back and forth between its maximum acceleration. Uh, important to note, when I am at Let's, let's take a quick look at this first point here. When I am at my highest point, right, I'm at my amplitude. Well, at that point, though, I'm at my highest point, but my velocity at that point is zero. And I see that with this point. I, I'm going to change colors because I'm sure this is getting a little confusing. My velocity at that point is also zero. And if I were to make a quick free body diagram at that point, my gravitational force is down. And my restoring force is pretty much non-existent um, because the spring is, is the least stretch that it'll be. So at that point, I have the greatest net force down, which also gives me my greatest negative acceleration. So this first point corresponds to this point, the highest amplitude, this point, zero velocity, and this point, greatest negative acceleration. So there's a lot going on with simple harmonic motion. But let me sum this up, give you some formulas, because I know you'd rather just have the formulas than try to be thinking through uh, making free body diagrams at every instantaneous point. So with those formulas, we get right here. So these are the formulas that sum up what's happening for position, velocity, and acceleration as a function of time. All of these are sinusoidal graphs and they all describe simple harmonic motion. So these formulas, position as a function of time, velocity as a function of time, and acceleration as a function of time, are all governed by the maximum for each of them. So position, we have a maximum amplitude. Well, that's that maximum position or maximum displacement from equilibrium. For velocity, we have a maximum velocity, and that maximum velocity is based on 
what's going on with this spring. What's its frequency? What's its amplitude? And for acceleration, we have a maximum acceleration. And that is, again, based on the conditions for the simple harmonic motion. What's its frequency? What's its amplitude? So these are all the formulas for it. You're going to use them once today. Really, you just got to more understand what's going on. And it's going to be less about uh, quantifying. So your homework, you should have already done the lab, obviously. Um, there is a graphic organizer that goes along with that. So you should be filling, you should have been filling that out as you watch this video. And then there is a homework week one. It's five questions kind of getting through uh, the concepts of simple harmonic motion. And that is what we're starting off this next unit with. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. We're probably going to be putting together some times for you guys to talk to us to make sure we can understand what's going on. And maybe we'll set up some more videos with some nice demonstrations uh, so we can better explain everything that's going on. Good luck with your, uh, your first assignment. Uh, feel free to let us know. Give us some feedback about what you thought about this first week of stuff you have to do. Um, this is, you know, kind of new for us. Um, we're just trying to figure out a few different ways and how we can make your time in isolation as beneficial as possible and still getting some learning done. All right. Have a good one.